Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. The Fed decision just around the corner. Equity futures just a little bit softer. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue. Investors looking to put together a year-end rally with the bulls emboldened by a soft inflation print. It's Fed Chair Jay Powell coming up next. The Fed meeting with the Fed meeting uh, and decision. We have the Fed announcement. Jay Powell, what are we going to hear from Chair Powell? We are seeing core and headline inflation move lower. Powell should definitely sort of speak to the encouraging news on inflation. I expect him to go 50. Obviously, they can step down to 50 basis points. But I expect him to downplay <clears throat> future rate hikes. Data of this nature allows them likely to do that. The focus is still going to be near term, what the Fed is going to do in, in February. They're trying to monitor how the economy is reacting to those hikes. It will all depend depend on how long um, inflation is going to be staying elevated. Sense of relief, but it's not over yet. Joining us now to discuss is JP Morgan's Bob Michael, Krishna Mamani of Lafayette College alongside him. Bob, first to you, does yesterday's inflation print change anything for the Fed today? Boy, I would love to know how many of the FOMC members went back and changed their terminal dot because they had a do-over, I believe, until last night to do it. Um, I, I don't I think on the margin, probably in the conversation, but the three things we're expecting is one, a step down to fifty basis points, two, a terminal uh, peak in the Fed funds rate somewhere around five percent, and for the chair to reiterate that it's too early to declare victory on inflation. So Bob, when it comes to the balance of risk, the assessment of the balance of risk from this Fed chair, do you think he still commits to this idea that the risk of doing too little outweighs the risk of doing too much? No, I, I think it's far more balanced. And I think after today, we're heading into a series of Fed meetings where gen, genuinely they will be data dependent. So they will look at the data. Every meeting um, is in play whether they raise rates or not. And we haven't had that for about a year. Krishna, your take? Well, so I disagree slightly with uh, Bob's assessment. I think. Uh, uh, the the balance uh, from the Fed's perspective hasn't really uh, it has definitely changed in certain areas, but the one area that they care about the most, which is the labor market, it really hasn't. So if you look at supply chain, better uh, uh, shelter, likely to be better uh, energy, better for sure. But labor, no change whatsoever. I, and I think the last employment uh, uh, release probably proved that point for them. So, yes, things are looking better, but right now they can't relent. And that's the message we are going to get today. So, Krishna, let's talk about a terminal rate. Closer to five, a five handle. What's the difference between what they signal in the dots and what you expect to materialize next year? Well, so I, I think 5% is the right assessment. I think the strategy for them, because other things have kind of panned out the way they expected it to, Trying to get terminal rate up to six, seven percent at this juncture doesn't really make any sense. So their strategy, both from a uh, uh, effectiveness standpoint and from a risk management standpoint, has to be take the terminal rate, uh, or take the rates up to the terminal rate of five percent, and just wait. And hopefully the labor market cooperates. And if it doesn't, then we'll see what they do. Will the market market buy what they're selling today? This was Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank. This quote here. The 23 median dot will superficially be bearish relative to the December 23 Fed fund futures, but not relative to market expectation for the dots themselves. If you don't understand that quote, here's this quote. The market will probably also take the Fed's higher end 23 dot as a way of the Fed trying to signal that they do not expect to cut rates in 23. That's something the market will continue to view with skepticism. Bob, I would love your thoughts on this. This battle between a market that's pricing in cuts and a Fed that's saying, no, 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 we're not doing that. How does this play out? Well, I, I think it, it plays out with the Fed pausing sometime over the next couple meetings and leaving rates wherever that may be, somewhere between 45 and 5 percent through year end, just to ensure that they've gained some traction on inflation. And Krishna is right. The labor market is still very tight. Wages are going up. At some point in time, the price increases, the sticker shock from that may just be 
uh, normal and wage gains will compensate for that. The other thing on the horizon is a reopening of China and that should add to a lot of consumption. So it is too early for the Fed to declare victory on inflation. So Bob, let's talk about rates. Two year right now, 420. Two year November 4th was pushing 480. That was two days after the Fed last met. Is 480 yet, Bob? Can we get back up to those levels at the front end? I would love to get back up there, but I don't think so. I, I think we've seen the peak in inflation. We've seen the peak in rates. I think the market told us at 480, the highest the Fed is going to get the Fed funds rate is four and three quarters. The market's going to be right yet again. Any kind of backup in yields you're supposed to buy. Krishna, you heard it there from Bob. We've seen the peak in inflation. A lot of people agree. Have we seen a peak in rates? I, I, I think we have seen the peak in rates. I think the likelihood that the two year gets back to the, the old level or through that, I think the likelihood of that in the current environment is, uh, is pretty small. I think it is working out the way the Fed expected it to work out, actually. So I think that gives them enough comfort to not take terminal rate meaningfully higher. And if the terminal rate is not going to be meaningfully higher, two year and for that matter, uh, even, uh, even the 10 year and 30 year, can't really go too much higher than where they have been uh, in, in the past and probably don't touch those levels anytime soon either. Krishna, are you more confident about the path for inflation or the path of growth next year? So uh, path of inflation, I think uh, you know, this is a unique cycle. So I would have liked to have said that path of inflation is pretty predictable at this point, given all the tightening that has happened. But because of the peculiarities of the labor market, uh, in this cycle, I, I don't think I can say that with a great deal of confidence. I think that the likelihood of that is quite high. That's what the Fed is hoping for. Um, and that will determine what the path of growth is in the fourth quarter of next year. The reason I ask this is because I think the overwhelming consensus going into 23 is for a softer period of growth through the first half. But HSBC pushed back against that yesterday with Max Kettner saying the following. We increasingly believe the widespread belief of a weak first half is misplaced. He went on to say that activity data is still surprising to the upside. Both top-down, bottom-up expectations have been downgraded so much in recent months that it makes further positive activity surprises likely. Krishna, what do you make of that assessment? I, I agree with that. I think the likelihood of, given both anecdotal and uh, kind of uh, systematic data that you can look at, uh, expecting meaningful slowdown in growth in the first half, I think is misplaced. I, we will see, if we do see slowdown in growth uh, substantially, uh, that will probably come in the second half rather than the first half. And therefore, and, and that's a big, bit of a challenge for the Fed because without that, the labor market is not going to soften. So they can't, you know, they have lost the narrative a little bit and they can't afford to lose the narrative even further. And that's why they will keep, uh, or at least I expect them to talk about the SCP and the projections and keep harping on that in this meeting and even in subsequent meetings. Bob, what about you? We've studied the, the previous periods of Fed rate hikes, <clears throat> and we've looked at the last five. And the interesting thing to us is the time from the last Fed rate hike until recession, and it's happened four of the last five rate hiking cycles, has been about 13 to 14 months. So those long and variable cumulative and lagged effects of monetary tightening, they do bite, but they don't bite in the next couple quarters. It takes about a year for them to bite. We think that moves forward. So we're with Krishna that recession is the latter half of next year because the new ingredient this time is quantitative tightening. So, Bob, we've got to talk about what that means for spreads. A lot of people have been pretty relaxed about how far credit spreads can break out on high yield. You haven't been one of them, Bob. We're at 426 right now. What are you advocating for at the moment? So, for sure, there, there's a tremendous uh, support for credit. And the one part of the credit spectrum we aren't that favorable on is high yield. We think in recession, high yield credit spreads go to 800 over. And I'm still convinced they are. I'm hearing a lot that, hey, these companies have termed out their debt for the next couple of years. They're much higher credit quality. True, but this time a lot of risk resides in the floating rate market. And there are three things to remember about the private credit and the floating rate market. One, for the first time, the private credit market is the size of the public high yield market. They're each one and a quarter trillion. The second is the credit quality of, of the floating rate bank loan market 
is substantially lower than it's ever been. If you go back to the financial crisis, debt to EBITDA was four times. Now the median is about five and a half times. And then lastly, this is where the refinancing wall is. Most of the debt that's been in, put in place in 2020, 2021, in the early part of 2022, was about 4%. As these companies have to refinance, they're refinancing at 9%. And these are the companies that are the lowest rated and least capable of affording that higher financing rate. Bob, could you how take it a step further? Mind. Could you just take it one step further? Could you explain to all of us how the risk embedded in private markets that you've just described has the potential to bleed over into public markets in a much more material way? It, it, it bleeds over in a lot of ways. As these companies go through restructuring, that's less economic growth. Of course, some of the, the largest clients of corporate America are other corporate clients. So if they're having trouble with some of their suppliers, their vendors, or uh, their customers, they're going to feel that impact. And I also worry that as, as you see these problems emerge in the private credit market or in the floating rate market, the, the one avenue to de-risk is going to be in the public credit market. Look, I've seen this cycle every single time in the past. The Fed finishes tightening rates. You have about a year till recession. In that period, you have all this talk about a soft landing. It's happened once. It happened in 94, 95. Uh, so we did have the soft landing in 95, and guess what? High yield credit spreads were at this level. So the market's pricing in soft landing. Krishna, final word. Well, so I, I agree with uh, Bob. I, I, I think expecting uh, the credit spreads, uh, if, if we do see a recession, expecting credit spreads to not widen in basically every cre credit category is just unrealistic. Uh, and, and I think even expecting them to not widen much is very, very unrealistic. If the recession scenario pans out, credit spreads are going to widen and they're going to widen dramatically. I need to get to Mike McKee because he's down in Washington, D.C. We're a few hours away from that rate decision from the Federal Reserve. And then it's the news conference with Chairman Powell. Mike McKee, the focus for you. You know how Bob Michael always likes to give you a question before you even get to speak? I'm going to let you speak <laughs> first, Mike. All right, but I'm looking forward to Bob's question. Uh, this is going to be an interesting meeting because, as you pointed out, this has been sort of the pattern for the last year. Uh, the Fed raises rates and Jay Powell comes out and gives a sort of hawkish news conference. We're kind of at a show where the actors have been giving us the plot before we even get the curtain up. And that's what's likely to happen today. 50 basis point move is all but baked in, takes us to a range of 425 to 45 percent. Guidance that we will see more rate increases and a warning to Wall Street, they'll keep the terminal rate in place for longer than people anticipate. We also get the new economic forecasts and the dot plot. Now, that's going to be interesting. Uh, to Krishna's point, unemployment, they only forecast it would go to 4.4%. Uh, not very much when you're raising rates as much as they have. And then they had it going down uh, to just 4.2%. Uh, for inflation, 3.1% next year, down to 2.1% in 2025. So it's going to take a while to get back to their target. How much do either of those variables change? And then the dot plot, that's what everybody's going to be looking for. That terminal dot up top there on the green line, does that move up significantly? Or do they keep their options open? And what about the spread? Uh, you look at how tight 2022 and 2023 are. Does uh, 2024 come together? Or is there a lot of division about where they're going? That, those are the things that we're going to be watching for today. Mike, stay close. Bob Michael, the floor is yours. Mike, if you go early, you can ask him that he's talked consistently about wanting positive real yields out across the curve. Now you have that by two important metrics. One is the tips curve. In the front end, you've got positive real yields of about 2%, and the long end, about 1%. If you try to estimate where the Fed funds rate is out in the future, we're looking at the overnight index swap, the OIS curve deflated by inflation swaps. It's now positive going out pretty much to infinity. So he has what he's asked for. Does that mean he can pause? If you go last, then you throw away the Marcus of <laughs> Queensberry rules and you ask him, does the chair believe that the current bout of disinflation is transitory? Mike McKee. <laughs>
Good questions, and we will. Uh, I'll put both of those on my list along with my question about uh, France or Morocco at the uh, news and the, conference. The counter programming for this is ridiculous. No, no. Look, guys, you have it wrong. FIFA d does not stand for football. It stands for fixed incomes, fashionable again. Is that right? Is that your new tagline, <laughs> Bob Michael? Can you be honest with our audience? When that news conference starts, are you watching Chair Powell or the football at J.P. Morgan? I'm going to have them both on. I'm sure you are. I will too, and I'll be on TV. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Bob Michael, Chris Romani, sticking with us. Coming up on this programme, the US poised to give Ukraine's defence system a bit of an upgrade. We do maintain a robust dialogue with our Ukrainian partners, with our allies, uh, and our international partners on Ukraine's security assistance needs. Uh, to include battlefield capabilities that, that they may need, uh, as well as air defense. That conversation, up next. We recognize that with the air threat that Russia poses to Ukraine, that air defense continues to be a priority topic of discussion when it comes to security assistance. And so we'll continue to look at ways that we can best support Ukraine to protect their population uh, and to protect uh, their, their broader infrastructure uh, to be able to survive these attacks. The Pentagon set to ramp up support for Ukraine to fend off Russian attacks, a decision to send the Patriot Air Defense System awaiting approvals from Defense Secretary Austin and President Biden as Russian drone targets the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, this morning. Ukraine's general staff has reported 11 missile attacks and more than 60 launches of rocket systems in the last day alone. Bloomberg's Josh Wingrove reporting from D.C. on this. Josh, can you get us up to speed on when this decision will ultimately be made? Yeah, it looks like maybe in the next you know, number of days uh, they could make this decision, but that is different from how quickly these things will get on the ground. These Patriot systems are very complicated. They require typically large crews. We don't even know which version of the Patriot system would be going to Ukraine. So the, the, the time from decision to time from sort of missiles ready to go into the air is the big question mark. We just don't know the answer right now. But these would be the most sophisticated systems and they're aimed at exactly what we're seeing in Kiev this morning, which is these long-range attacks that are targeting, in some cases, you know, power infrastructure, domestic civilian infrastructure. Having Patriot missiles is something that Ukraine has been asking for for a long time. It's one of those things near the top of the wish list to try to boost the chances that they can pluck these missiles out of the sky before they hit a power station or what have you. And the West, of course, is taking steps right now to sort of invest and rebuild these power systems, you don't want to be doing that if a missile is going to come back a week or a month later and just blow it all up again. So it, it's kind of like, it seems like an implied insurance policy for the efforts of the U.S. and its allied countries to rebuild this civilian target that uh, are targets that are being hit by these missiles. But it, it is the latest in a drumbeat of increased munitions going from the U.S. The Biden is consistently sending stuff that at the start of the war he did not want to send. Josh, just briefly, can we touch on that? Well understood as to why they want them, why we might send them, why the reluctance to send them. Why might they make the decision not to? The reluctance is around escalation and counteroffenses, uh, and the U.S. has been very cautious about being the one to sort of up the ante in a way that would give Putin an excuse to go even further than he's gone. Now, the thinking has changed for a number of reasons. One of that is he seems to be going pretty far anyway. Now, uh, as for whether these Patriot missiles will help counteroffensives, analysts will tell you that uh, other systems like tanks and other missile systems would be actually what they need to sort of launch attacks deeper into Russia. This isn't about that, and that probably gives some calm to the Americans, but it's still very complex. As I say, firing these things is tough. So this is, this, this is one they're grappling with. That's why I think we're, we're hearing signals that no final decision has come from the defense secretary and from Biden himself. Hey, Josh, looking out for your reporting through today and into the weekend. Josh Wingrove there Thanks. down in Washington, D.C. The team at Bank of America writing this on crude, and this is important. Russian sanctions, low inventories, China reopening, an OPEC that's willing to cut production in case demand weakens, keeps energy prices high. Their call for next year, look at these numbers. Brent crude could average 100 per barrel over the course of 23 and spike in the second half of the year to maybe 110. Final word now with Bob Michael, Chris Mamani. Bob, you mentioned China reopening. We've got to talk about the war in Europe as well. 
This has been another, another impetus to make calls of higher stickier inflation through much of this year, Bob. How do you think about these issues going into 2023? Well, there, there are two things that we all hoped would have been resolved, that there would have been some sort of resolution between Russia and Ukraine, and there would be something which, which would allow China to reopen. It looks like we're going to get one, not the other. Uh, it turns out to be the worst combination for inflation because where you would have gotten some energy production back into the markets again with some peace in Russia, Ukraine, it looks like it's going the other way. Uh, so that's not going to happen yet with China reopening the demand for energy to, to run those factories all out and for also to people to get out and spend and consume and travel around. That demand is going to be there. Um, <clears throat> so I'm sympathetic to seeing uh, the price of oil back at $100 a barrel. Krishna, final word. Well, I, I think it is a possible scenario. Uh, I somehow don't think it is the likely scenario. And the driver for that is really the, a, a slowdown, a, a modest slowdown from really high level of activity uh, in this quarter in the second, in the first half of next year, both here and, and in Europe. To the two of you, this was absolutely excellent. Thanks for your time. Bob Michael, Krishna Mamani, thank you very much. Looking ahead to the Federal Reserve and at the same time, not at the same place. We'll be watching the World Cup taking place over in Qatar, I'm sure, competing with Chairman Powell in that news conference. Equities right now on the S&P 500, just a little bit negative, down a tenth of 1%. Coming up, the morning calls in later. The latest inflation print providing some relief for the Fed. Cathy Jones and Charles Schwab looking for 50 today and 25 basis points in the first quarter next year. More on that around the opening bell. Two days of gains coming into Wednesday. This morning, equities down by about a tenth of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, down by two tenths of 1%. Chair Powell, Fed decision just around the corner. Let's get you some morning calls briefly. Bank of America downgrading Best Buy to underperform. $69 price target, citing a challenging demand environment. That stock is down by almost 4%. City downgrading Marriott to neutral, 175 price target, expecting more macroeconomic and capital markets uncertainty. That stock is down by 1.3%. And finally, Goldman cutting Tesla's price target to 235, citing softer demand and macro conditions. That stock down again this morning by 1.5%. Coming up, less than 24 hours away, counting down to Chair Powell's news conference. That conversation with Bank of America's Mike Gapin and Kathy Jones and Charles Schwab. Up next, your opening bow with futures lower by a tenth of 1%, just around a corner. It is Fed decision day. We are 22 seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning to you all. Futures are lower, negative by just a tenth of 1%. Two-day winning streak coming into Wednesday. On the Nasdaq, we're down about two tenths of 1% on the Russell of small caps. Just a little bit softer. The opening bow in New York, ringing, switch at the board and get to the bond market. Yields much lower since this Fed last met on a 10-year right now unchanged at 350. Highs for the year of about 430. Look at a two-year this morning. The two-year in early November, had a little look at 480. This morning, 420. In the FX market, big turnaround there as well over the last couple of months. Euro dollar from sub parity back to 106.40. Firmer again this morning by a tenth of 1%. And just to round things up, crude. Crude right now 76.74, up by 1.8%. 20 seconds into the session, your equity market dead flat, unchanged on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're down by about a tenth of 1%. If you want to move, a one stock to watch in the open is Delta. The company boosting its profit outlook and keeping a bullish travel forecast. The CEO saying this in a statement. Demand for air travel remains robust as we exit the year, and Delta's momentum is building. Kaylee Lines, it never ends. It never does. We're going to be paying a lot for airline tickets for some time to come, it seems, John. But it also is boosting Delta stock. It's up more than 3% at the opening bell and taking some of those air carrier peers along with it, the likes of United and American, even JetBlue, all gaining by about 1% at the opening bell. Now, what the numbers actually look like for Delta, they have raised their fourth quarter profit forecast to between $1.35 and $1.40 a share. That is up from the earlier guide with a high range, end of the range at one twenty-five. For the full year, they see up to $3.12 of profit. Analysts were only looking for two eighty-nine. 
time. What is so interesting, though, is they actually narrowed uh, the revenue view. They now say sales will increase about 7 to 8% this quarter. The earlier range went up to 9% growth. So a narrower top line view, wider bottom line one. Clearly, margins going to be a lot fatter than analysts were expecting, thanks to those elevated ticket prices. And to that point, just take a look at revenue per average seat mile. The last two quarters, Delta has posted the highest revenue per seat mile flown ever in data going back to 2007, up north of $18. And this points to the strong demand that Ed Bastian was talking about. What is so interesting, though, is we have to contrast what we're hearing from Delta today with what we heard from other carriers yesterday. JetBlue warning that the holiday period, the fourth quarter, demand is shaping up worse than expected. Alaska narrowed its revenue forecast, noting a softening in corporate travel bookings. You also had Spirit reducing its capacity forecast. So interesting the divergence here between lower cost carriers and the major carriers and maybe who is ultimately willing to pay this much for airline seats. It's going to be a big question going into 23. It was a big question coming into 2022 as well. Down to right now uh, by more than 3%. Kelly, thank you. Tesla, down by about 1% this morning from September. Lisa was saying earlier this morning on Bloomberg Surveillance, it's down about 50% since September. Investors pointing the finger at Twitter. Others, including Goldman, citing softer demand concerns. Elon Musk firing back, tweeting the following. Tesla will be great long term, but doesn't control macroeconomic tides. Let's get to Ed Ludlow on the West Coast some more. Ed, which one is it? Are we blaming Twitter here in that relationship, or is it the demand backdrop? It seems to be all of the above. It's hard to unpick. We're down for a third straight day. We're down in seven of the last eight sessions. We're coming off the worst two-day drop for this stock since April. Elon Musk has been tweeting about uh, macroeconomic conditions on more than one occasion in the last week. He's also been tweeting quite a lot about the Fed, saying beware debt when the Fed is raising rates. Um, you know, I, I continue, John, to talk to in investors on the institutional side, and also remember how influential the base of retail investors are for this stock. These are people that own the stock in kind of meaningful volumes and are also owners of the vehicle. And as one, you know, fan of Tesla, Riedel must put it, that we've never seen this community more divided than they are right now. Many of them are looking at the news flow coming out of China and saying, you know, we want to hear from you, Elon, about what's happening on the demand side in China. As you know, John Bloomberg reported that there's a pullback in production in terms of the hours per shift and also onboarding new staff. Tesla's also cut prices in that market. That would indicate it's a demand issue. On the other hand, it's also standard practice for Tesla to hit pause on the assembly line at quiet times of year to make maintenance. Bloomberg's also reported that. I would also say that the Adam Jonas from Morgan Stanley's out with a note this morning where they've downgraded their EV penetration outlook for the U.S. market by about two percentage points for 2025 to 11%. You know, it's as if this market's kind of losing steam. Now, there's also downward pressure, of course, from what's going on at Twitter, because as Bloomberg's reported, Musk is considering scrapping the unsecured debt in favor of margin loans secured against the stock that, as you say, is down 50 percent since since September, I believe. Right. So, gosh, there's a lot at play here for a single name. That disconnect between the Nasdaq and Tesla is quite something to see. Ed, thank you, sir. As always, looking at the broader market, about four or five minutes into this, we're positive by two tenths of one percent on the S&P and the Nasdaq, up two tenths of one percent also. Counting it down to Chairman Powell a little bit later, this is what Mike Gapen of Bank of America has to say, looking for a hawkish message from the Fed chair. Services inflation remains too hot. We expect the Fed to emphasize that more work needs to be done, particularly in labor markets where demand outstrips supply. Mike, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Mike, can you build on that? What are you looking for a little bit later this afternoon? Right. Good morning, and thank you for having me on. So I, I think the, the first part of the message will be a positive one, that it does look like we're past peak inflation and falling commodity prices and declines in goods prices are what's responsible for that. So on one hand, some very good and very welcome news. But I think the Fed will then step back and say, look, our, our goal is more than just putting inflation on a downward trend. The goal is to get it back to 2%. And in that regard, the labor market remains too hot. Labor demand is outstripping labor supply. And services inflation is still inconsistent with 2% outcomes. So more work needs to be done on that point. So good news. But the hard work, to use Powell's language, the hard work still lies in front of us. And Mike, this has been one of the big features, I think, of your call alongside the rest of the team at B of A going into next year. You still believe that risks are skewed to a higher terminal rate. Now, Mike, what's that relative to? Market pricing, the dots in the dot plot from September. What is it? I think to, to market pricing and, and just that. Look, we don't really know exactly where 
you know, sufficiently restrictive is, right? And so the Fed's feeling its way at, at this point in time. And the Fed's message can be, you know, more, you know, more balanced at this point because it will ultimately be data dependent. But the labor market's going to drive what constitutes sufficiently restrictive. And there we're still adding 272,000 jobs per month over the last three months. And the wage data all suggests things there are, are, are pretty strong. So I think upside risk in terms of exactly how much tightening will be needed to begin to remove some of those imbalances in the labor market suggests, I, I think, still risks to a, a higher terminal rate. When that may happen, of course, will depend on how the economy evolves. Um, but so good news, but not all the way there yet from the Fed's perspective. Well, let's put some numbers on it. So you're on the same page as Goldman with Hatsius at City with Hollenhorst, B of A, all three of you, looking for 5 to 5.25 for the median dot next year. So when you say upside risk to that, Mike, what kind of number are you thinking about? I mean, maybe it's not, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that ultimately we may, we may need to be in, in the 5.5 to perhaps 6 range. Um, again, whether the Fed just kind of keeps edging its policy rate higher and we would get there, say, in the middle of next year, or the Fed pauses for a while to kind of see how this inflation evolution plays out and maybe has to come back in to, to do more work later, I, I think that all remains to be seen. But the point here is simply to say 2% outcomes will, will be predicated on, on getting labor demand and labor supply back in balance. The Fed's done a lot of work already. But employment growth and wages are, are still pretty strong, and, and the consumer has some momentum to its spending. So I just think it's unsure exactly where that appropriate terminal rate is. And you know, I'm not sure 475 to five would would be enough. And I'm not, you know, I think five to five and a quarter will be enough. But I think the labor market is telling you things are still pretty strong underneath the hood. Interesting, Mike Gape, and this was great of Bank of America. Michael Gapen there, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. Thank you. Kathy Jones and Charles Schwab waiting patiently, listening to that. Kathy, I'd love your thoughts initially on what Mike Gapen had to say. Well, I generally agree that it's the labor market that's going to drive the Fed's decision making over the next year or so. Um, I tend to be um, in the camp, though, that says 5% is plenty in terms of the terminal rate. I, I think the um, evidence is building that we are we have past peak inflation, that we are seeing softening in the economy in a number of different areas, and the global economy still feeling the effects of all the tightening, the cumulative tightening over the last year or so, really just kind of working its way through the system now. So we think the surprises in in the next set of data over the next six months or so will be to the downside, and that'll give the room uh, room for the Fed to kind of halt they are tightening. Um, I, I think the, the problem today for, for Powell is he doesn't have enough information to make that call. So uh, today's message will likely be, yeah, we're pleased with the way things are going, but I would agree more work to be done. And I think the market's not quite ready for that message. So, Kathy, are you unconvinced by the argument that Mike offered that this labor market will be ultimately too tight and the risks are skewed to the upside for Fed funds that maybe 475 doesn't get it done? Why doesn't that convince you? Uh, well, we're seeing more softness in some of the underlying um, employment data that I think than uh, than others are seeing. And there's even a, a study out today from the Philadelphia Fed saying that the benchmark revisions may actually subtract some jobs, pretty considerable number of jobs. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's the Fed's call. So they seem to think a 5% Fed funds rate is a good terminal rate, that that's probably good enough. So that doesn't seem unreasonable to us, but I think the surprises will be on the soft side. It's, it sort of begs the imagination that we could have had all the major central banks of the world, along with a bunch of emerging market central banks, tightening policy over the last year, quantitative tightening, and yet, you know, we're not going to see inflation slow down. That just doesn't seem consistent. So, Kathy, from listening to you, there's a disconnect here between what the Fed will signal potentially later on this afternoon and what you think is achievable. Kathy, I don't think you're alone. So with that in mind, when they come out later and they potentially signal a much higher terminal, right, maybe it's just below five, maybe it has a five handle, that median dot in 2023. How do you think the market's going to respond to that incoming information, Kathy, given that you have doubts and you're not alone? 
Yeah, I think that's the conundrum we're facing right now. Does the curve steepen or does it does it uh, does it flatten and invert more? I think the initial reaction, the short end seems a little rich to me. I think we've priced in, you know, a Fed pivot, uh, lower rates down the the road, and I don't think that's the Fed signal. So I think the short end is vulnerable to repricing along a different path of Fed funds. The long end, you know, we've been in the camp that saw long term rates coming down. Now at three and a half, you know, we're kind of at a a place where we're we think it's a pretty reasonable value. We do think there's a risk of going down to three percent uh, next year, but it probably is going to be a bumpy ride. So I, I I'm a little concerned about how the short end is priced going into this announcement. Questions for Chairman Powell in the press, sir. Kathy, have you got one? Yeah, you know, I would love to understand more about how the Fed views quantitative tightening and its impact on the economy. Um, you know, you get mixed messages about its importance uh, to the Fed in terms of setting policy. I'd like a clearer message on how they see that going forward. Kathy Jones, our town might be key. I'll do our best because I think he's got a long list of questions from Bob Michael as well. Kathy, it's good to catch up as always. Your equity market looks like this about. 12 minutes into the session, we're positive by a third of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're up by two tenths of 1%. Yields come in just a little bit, only by three basis points. No drama we're on a two year right now, just sub 420. On a 10 year, 349. We're down by just a single basis point. Coming up on this program, Sam Bankman Fried facing a long legal battle ahead. It's so hard to compare these things, but I, I think it's fair to say that by any, anyone's lights, this is one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. That conversation up next. This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, former New York Fed President Bill Dudley. That conversation at 10:30 a.m. in New York, 3:30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. It's so hard to compare these things, but I, I think it's fair to say that by any anyone's lights, this is one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. This investigation is very much ongoing, and it is moving very quickly. In terms of whether we're going to bring charges against anyone else, um, look, I can only say it this clearly, but we are not done. FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried remains in jail ahead of the Senate FTX hearing later today following a day of scathing testimony from the new FTX CEO on Capitol Hill. The FTX group's collapse appears to stem from absolute concentration of control in the hands of a small group of grossly inexperienced and unsophisticated individuals who failed to implement virtually any of the systems or controls that are necessary for a company entrusted with other people's money or assets. Pretty brutal stuff. Team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Shanali Basak, AMH down in D.C. as well. Shanali, first to you. What can we expect a little bit later? A few things. Remember, the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, Sherrod Brown, has been very skeptical of digital assets. And you have Pat Toomey, who himself has said he bought the hype and by the end of the year is trying to pass a narrow bill to regulate digital assets in some way, though he wanted a larger framework. Remember, testifying today, we also have two celebrities, including Kevin O'Leary, who took money from Sam Bankman-Fried himself, who supports digital assets more, more broadly here. But then you also have Ben McKenzie, another celebrity, who has said that, you know, he's used to lying. He's an actor, but uh, the, if you look at the crypto industry, it's full of lies itself. So that's what we expect at the onset of the hearing. Remember, Cynthia Loomis is also part of this particular committee. There's the Loomis Gillibrand bill that they wanted to pass regarding digital assets. And then Elizabeth Warren, also part of this committee as well. And Elizabeth Warren introduced a new bill today to combat money laundering in the industry, to extend know your customer rules that are in the banking industry already and extend them now to digital assets. So in addition to a lot of rhetoric, as we've been hearing for the last couple of days, remember Sam Bankman-Fried, his presence having loomed very large within the U.S. Capitol, very clearly so with all my conversation with lawmakers on the sidelines of these hearings, John, in addition to this debacle, figuring out the path forward is definitely a key concern for these lawmakers. It's not out of interest. The relevance of bringing celebrities to testify, why is that important? 
Well, first of all, Sam Bankman Freed is not here himself. Remember, even before the arrest, he did not accept the subpoena from this committee to be here himself. But the celebrities, remember, the SEC has targeted celebrities for pumping up cryptocurrencies. There are also two academics here as well that I'll speak to the issue of leverage in the system. So you have kind of both sides here, the responsibility for the correct type of marketing to the American uh, retail investor, as well as the nuance here be between these brokers and exchanges that have gone virtually unregulated uh, for so long and a recognition here that maybe they should have been much sooner. I'm looking forward to your coverage of it. MH, I want to come across to you. You've been following this story around campaign finances. What's going to happen with that yeah. money? Well, that's a great question, Jonathan. And as Shanali was saying, that is why this story is hitting so close to Washington, because so many politicians were lured in by these big donations. And a lot of them we already see have either given money back to charity that was given to them from Sam Bankman Freed or one of his top lieutenants, or they plan to. What we do know is that from the DOJ, remember it's the DOJ, the CFTC, and the SEC that he has all come under fire from, but the DOJ, it's eight criminal counts. And one of them is about charges of violating campaign finances. So they're going to have to do a lot of digging on this. Uh, potentially some of these super PACs will have to give money back. Um, so far they have not. But that's what this is going to come down to. There's a criminal charge against him about this. And obviously it's incredibly embarrassing for a lot of these politicians. Amory, let's talk about those politicians. How are certain politicians, maybe in the opposition party, using these hearings as a moment to message and message pretty hard? Well, there want to be messages on the Republican side, of course, because he was number two in this election uh, cycle in terms of giving to the Democrats, right? He was a big mega donor for the Democratic Party. But as you heard from um, the attorney yesterday from the Southern District of New York, he gave to both political ends, especially when you look at his uh, deputy, his, one of his top lieutenants, who really gave heavily to the Republican side of the aisle. But what I think what you're hearing from the Republicans is that they feel that the Democrats were cozying up to him. But it really could be seen on both sides in terms of the money that was coming in. Democrats and Republicans, really no one was hands off when it comes to Sam Bankman Free trying to, as this is the what uh, Damian Williams said, Dirty money used in service of Bankman Freed's desire to buy bipartisan influence and impact the direction of public policy in Washington. This is unraveling very, very quickly. And Shanali, I just wanted to give you a final word on that. Unraveling fast, but it still feels like we're only scratching the surface. This is just one individual. Shanali, how many others do you expect to be brought into this? I think you have to expect here that everybody that was in his inner circle will be taken a hard look at. When I talk to lawmakers on the side down here, what they say too is very often when they were meeting with Sam Bagman Freed, they were also meeting with his parents and his, his deputies over at FTX as well. And so uh, how far does this go? Who knew what? The SEC complaint very strongly outlines that Sam Bagman Freed was more involved in Alameda than he himself had said. So what else don't we know? John is going to be found out over the next several months or so. I'm sure this will take a long time to unravel. I'm looking forward to the hearing, which commences in about eight minutes' time. Shanali Bassa, KMH, to the both of you. Thank you, as always. About 22 minutes into the session, our focus shifting, of course, to that Federal Reserve decision. Right now, the S&P up by four-tenths of one percent. The Nasdaq up by around about a quarter of one percent with some sector price action. Here's Kaylee. Hey, Kaylee. Hey, John. Well, as we've gained some steam, most sectors also have moved into positive territory. The leaders early on include utilities, consumer staples, and technology, which is why you're seeing uh, the Nasdaq up a little bit here. At the bottom, though, materials and communication services. Within that, that index down about three-tenths of one percent, but you zero in on media and then on cable, that's where you see the real underperformance because charter communications is down 14% worst day for the stock since March 2020. And this is a CapEx problem. The company unveiled a three-year network spending budget that is bigger than analysts anticipated and clearly not liking that in an environment in which th this you have to spend more to spend more. The cost of capital is rising. Charter, therefore, falling by 14 percent and taking some of those cable peers down with it, John. Kelly Lyons, great work as always. Up next, your trading diary from New York City on this Fed decision day. This is Bloomberg.
three-day rally on the S&P 500. So far, so good. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Equities up this morning by four-tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up by around about a third of 1%. Will it stick going into the Fed? Let's get you the trading diary. That was the price action coming up. The FDX testimony on Capitol Hill continues at the Senate. In the Senate, at the top of the hour, President Biden speaking at 1.30 Eastern time. A Fed rate decision coming at 2 p.m., followed by Chairman Powell's news conference. Football match happening at the same time. Of course, I'll be so focused on the one thing, the Fed. Rate decisions from the BOE and the ECB coming up on Thursday, plus another round of jobless claims. Retail sales in America still to come. And we round out the week with PMIs on Friday. From New York City, this was the countdown to the open. I'll see you a little bit later for Fed coverage. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This is Bloomberg.